And you just missed a whole big one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anybody who is just picking this up on the video in particular, boy, you just missed out on some That means you just have to check out the actual podcast to yeah. get about three seconds more. If we're smart, we'll cut it, but, you know. <sighs> when have we ever done that? <laughs> what if we've been smart? Be sure there. to tune in next week, apparently. <laughs> There are so many things. Um, we're well. Welcome back. First of all, happy well, new, happy yeah. new year. We were not. We didn't do it last it's week. It's strange that it was only one week because it feels like a hundred. It's been one week. Um, very naked ladies. That reference. song's gonna be a mess. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, it's a new year. New me. Um, new year, new name for my daughter. That's true. Yeah. Congratulations to Jesse. Thank and you. and uh and my saw nephew that Joshua got engaged, got engaged yeah. last night. That was That was exciting. a good call on his part, so he'll later on he can play that as romantic when he remembers when he proposed because you know oh yeah, Jesse's Dan's anniversary. He probably did that on purpose so. so he wouldn't forget. It's a smart kid. I can see that being a Josh yeah, thing. Smart kid. Anyway, um yeah, we're back in the saddle again. Yeah, we are. Um <clears throat> we finished up Advent and we are eventually getting into a new series in Ephesians, but before that, we are doing this little three week yeah, we, quote unquote series. You know, uh it works out well timing wise with my little girl getting married over the weekend. Um and then, you know, on Sunday we uh, we looked at the idea of marriage from scripture. Uh, but as as we've progressed um, in, in our society, and when I say progressed, I really mean I was re- gonna say, regressed. What? But, we? but the as we've evolved or devolved <clears throat> um, since 2003, when we started uh, Real Life Community Church, it's become necessary for us to clarify some things in our in our beliefs and our understanding of of issues. Never. Um, we never have had a statement, a, a policy or position statement on things like marriage, sexuality, and family and, and life issues uh, because we didn't think that they were needed um, because of, we believe in the Bible. And so our, our core beliefs reflect that. But now in the last 15 years, we've, it's become so prevalent. It's always been the case, but, but now it's prevalent um, that people don't know what it means hmm. to have the Bible be your authority. Uh, we have people, uh, in, in, including famous people like Pete Buttigieg out there, deciding that they get to, to say what the Bible says without actually the Bible saying it. And, and so we have folks who are believing um, these social commentators and even people who call themselves pastors, although I am loath to, uh, to give them that title, um, who are teaching about marriage, sexuality, and family as if it bears biblical authority when it does not. And further undermining the authority of the scriptures so that we have everything from what the Bible doesn't actually teach against homosexuality, uh, that's misinterpretation or mistranslation, all these other kinds of things, which is patently false and ridiculously untenable. Um, but tell me how you really <clears throat> Yeah, I, I probably <clears throat> soft-pedaled that too much. I'll see if I can be a little more clear next week. But, uh, but we go from that uh, place to, well, the Bible, um, the Bible actually supports it. It's, it's there, but it's, you know, it, we need to be superseding the teachings of morality with the teachings of love that, that Jesus puts out because... Jesus doesn't talk about homosexuality. He just talks about loving everybody. Just love everybody and, and we'll all have flowers and it'll be happy and pretty. <clears throat> Which is, again, ridiculous, foolish, untenable, not biblical, and, and historically inaccurate at every level. And then we also have those who are saying, well, really, yeah, the Bible says it, but it doesn't really matter because... It's a living document, like the Constitution. It doesn't have to mean what it says it means. It means whatever we want it to mean. And so we'll just keep on uh, pressing forward. And, and it's, you know, you can't look at, you know, biblical morality, because there's no one biblical morality. There's a lot of different moralities that show up in the Bible. And so if you're going to pick and choose, you know, God doesn't, smite all these people for polygamy clearly polygamy is okay in the old testament well why do we say it's not okay if it's okay there uh you know if, if you're going to cling to things like 
Leviticus 18, uh, then why do you eat shrimp when the law of Moses clearly condemns that? So anyway, there's so many different takes on it. We want to you know, evolve the message of the scripture. And we need to establish um, in this podcast, in our church, in, in, the, in the center of Orthodox, universal, or Catholic Christianity, um, that the Bible is our standard for truth and practice. Mm-hmm. It is the authority by which we, our lives are governed. It is the revealed character and heart of God, His will and commands for our lives. And as uh, one of our elders and I were talking about uh, after church on Sunday, it's not enough for us to just have the rules. Hmm. It, it, so we have, we have kind of a twofold problem as we deal with marriage, sexuality, and family in our society today. Uh, particularly, and when I say in our society, yes, in the main, but, but really uh, we need to focus on, on the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, our society as it pertains to those who claim to be Christians. Because those who don't, you can say this stuff and they probably aren't going to care. Yeah, right? there's, <laughs> they still have to deal with it. Right. You know, and they are still but affected by it and they still stand before God for it. But they aren't going to care from not, a biblical perspective yeah, right at this they're point. They're not concerned about it. Right. And so to expect unbelievers to act like believers, is, is that, that's not a logical um, pursuit and it doesn't work. Right. But as believers, as those who claim to be Christ followers... Um, we have a twofold problem. We don't know anymore what the rules are. We don't what what is good, what is bad. We don't we don't know. Right. And, and we've been lied to by people who are supposed to be leading us mm-hmm. in the faith. Uh, and, and we've talked about this extensively, you and I, uh, as well as on the podcast that we have local churches here who have promoted actively promoted ungodliness uh, and immorality. As if they are good things. Right. So this is a, a very dangerous place to be where we have Christians growing up that just don't, really, I never heard that I'm not supposed to do that. I never heard that that was a bad thing. And so in speaking the truth, you're probably going to offend some people and and uh, well, if make things uncomfortable. If we're not, that means we don't have any listeners out there. Because realistically... Well, you know, <laughs> we do in the UK. <laughs> in those in the UK, where things are probably even more liberal than here at this well, point. But, but I'm just uh, saying, these are because of where we are as a society, saying, uh, you know, and we'll get into it here what we talked about on Sunday, <clears throat> saying these things, I think, to a lot of people can be at the very least uncomfortable and at most offensive for sure uncomfortable and i think that that's part of the problem that that we deal with i alluded to that on sunday the word sexuality was repeated over and over in the sermon on purpose because it's uncomfortable for us to say it in a church setting you know it's funny how many people are comfortable hearing all sorts of crassness or inappropriate things if you're watching reruns of Friends or, right. you, know, you know... And that's tame compared to... <laughs> watching so many right. things on television or listening to songs and we can talk about it, even joke about it, but have a serious conversation about it and talk about it in church and everybody's like looking down. It's amazing how many people were looking down on Sunday. <clears throat> um, I was kind of teasing my nephew, Josh, who just got engaged. Hi, Josh, if you're paying attention, but I know you're not listening. So anyway, uh, as... uh, Called out. (laughs) If you see this, Joshua, or you hear this, text me so I can know it. Blink twice. But anyway... uh, I know Heidi listens. As we were talking about it, uh, it started out we were talking about cattle because my Mm. daughter and her husband are... I just said her husband. Uh, That's new, huh? How did that feel? Uh, But they're both veterinarians, and so they... On their honeymoon, because veterinarians are obviously weird, uh, they decided to come do a pregnancy check on our cattle herd mm-hmm. uh, during their honeymoon, which that's normal, I suppose, for weird veterinarians. Anyway, uh, so as they were talking about this, and talking, just you know, clinically talking about right. uh, different things and, and how they do the checking, uh, Josh was visibly uncomfortable, not with the process, but with the words right. that they were saying it. And so, you know, we kind of chuckled and I pointed out that that's why I had to keep saying this word because we have to get to a place where we move past the idea that sex is one of those things we don't talk about. You know, we, we can joke about it. We can't talk about it in a Christian setting because it's dirty. Right. And we think of it as and you've dirty. Said it the other, you said it the other day that we, 
have perverted it. Right. it and That's right. It's not that way, it, but we have made it that way. There are zero sexual jokes, crude jokes in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. There are lots of places where it talks about sex, even talks about sex explicitly and in, in very, um, uh, how do I want to say this? Uh, n not euphemistically, hmm. but addressing it in very coarse language on purpose as the prophets are describing the harlotry of Israel, the, their adultery against the Lord. And so the language that is used there is explicit and deliberate and, and offensive. And it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But it's never taken lightly. It's mm -hmm. never made a joke. And so I mean, even Paul refers, uh, he's talking about the body of Christ and how we're each members of the body. And he makes a little reference in there that is small in that context, but is, but is really big and carries a lot of weight. When he talks about the fact that the parts of our body that we consider unpre unpresentable, non-public, we might call them private parts, uh, we treat with special honor. The, I don't Trust have, me, I have a three-year-old who just yesterday asked because <laughs> we're potty training. And he hasn't figured out to treat with special honor yet. No, yet. not so, yet. He'd just rather run around. So, <laughs> welcome to Raising Boys. Sometime I'll share some stories. But yeah. anyhow, as we're... Uh, Shelly is better at sharing those stories. As we um, see that, just as you're doing it, you teach your child modest, modesty, mm -hmm. cover up, don't go to town without pants on, things like that. Uh, but you don't say, don't let anybody see your hands. Right. Don't let anybody see your face, you know, uh, although today with masks. But right. anyhow, that we treat those parts that are unpresentable and that the world might call dirty, the naughty bits, if you will. Um, don't ever say that again. Yeah, that, well, <laughs> but th that's, those are the things right, that we no, say I, so that um, we get a different picture. Even the, even the different euphemisms that we use, they, they denigrate what God has designed as part of his image in us. He did this on purpose. And so we need to understand that. So we, we don't understand what the rules are, but even more than that, we don't understand why the rules are what they are. So you have kids growing up in Christian youth groups and and not, they're hearing, don't have sex before you're married. Don't do this. Don't do that. And those things aren't wrong, but there's no foundation to it. It's just rules that means I am not supposed to get caught, right? These are right. the things. And even just the change in language from uh, in previous generations, talking about fornication to now referring to premarital sex, we've made it a matter of timing, a matter of chronology rather than a matter of covenant. So that it's it's not just that, you know, if you wait three hours, then the wedding will be over, you know, you'll right. be ready to go. It's that there is a sacred covenant involved. It's ontologically different at that point. And so... Yeah, if you have rules and you don't know what the rules are for, you're less likely they're to They're not going to stick. Right. right. So, you know, and as a parent, you you probably are already learning this, but you'll really learn it as your child grows. There's an obedience that comes because I have to, mm -hmm. right? Mom's right. here. Because and if I, I said so. Right. If I don't right. do it, uh, there's a fear of punishment. But if all that motivates my obedience is a fear of wrath, then when that, that threat anything. of wrath is removed... Right mom's not here, right. then my motivation for obedience goes away. Mm -hmm. But if I understand why, I understand mom loves me. So when mom tells me something, it's for my best. I may not understand it now, but I will I may not like it. <laughs> and I definitely may not like it. But there's, I can trust mom. I can trust dad, which is, again, the, this is part of what we're going to be seeing in the next three weeks here. This is a picture of our relationship with the Lord. There are things that he tells us that we do because he tells us. And we may not understand them now. Or like. But when we understand him, when we trust him, and I, you know what? I, I love my father. I know my father loves me, and he does not command things that are not in my best interest. Mm -hmm. Everything that he orchestrates is for his eternal glory and my eternal good. When I recognize that, then I begin to look at those rules differently. Right. When it's not this cosmic killjoy trying to squash my fun, and the world is telling us that all the time. You know, this, you know, sex is a, a beautiful thing that we're, well, that's partially true. Isn't that exactly what the devil did mm -hmm. in Genesis 3? When the serpent says, did God really say, you know, 
no, he's just trying to keep you from, from having everything that you can have. Well, the truth of the matter is he's offering them things that they already had. You'll be like God. They were already like God. They bore God's image. They were more like God than anything, including that serpent. But he, he tempted them with what God had already offered them free to then go and get that illicitly. So the same pleasures that God intends for us within the context of wholesomeness and purity, the devil promises us in ways that are illicit and harmful. And so uh, someone said, it might have been Neil Anderson, I don't recall who it was that, that I'm stealing this from, but said that, that the essence of, of sinful behavior is that we are seeking to meet legitimate needs through illegitimate means. Mm. So God has wired us, he's designed us to be relational. Part of that is to be sexual. He created us male and female on purpose in Genesis 127. And so that is part of, of who we are. And are there exceptions? Yes, and the Bible refers to those exceptions. But those are exceptions. There are people who, who have, uh, as, as we would often call it in the church, the gift of celibacy. That is not the norm, but it is sometimes uh, the reality. So as we are, are working through all of these things, the, the purpose for which God designed them remains even if that particular expression is not present mm-hmm. for us. So if we, if we don't do it the right way, if we get this wrong, we get everything wrong. So God offers us a joyful, vibrant, beautiful... Uh, the reason I keep coming back to sex is not because that's the center say, of it, right. it, but because we're so focused on it in our society that, that that's where we're getting it distorted. But ultimately, this is about marriage. Right. And sex is part of marriage and can't be separated from it. And family, reproduction, is part of sex and can't be separated from it. So all of the things that we see today, even if they're not in themselves innately sinful, uh, I don't know if I can get into that today, but maybe maybe it'll come up next time. Um when we are seeking to separate the concepts that God designed to be inseparable, we are acting in rebellion against mm-hmm. him. So the purpose, of, as we've seen society develop with the, the advent of birth control, uh, which was primarily it's not, not just for you know, the different things that, that happen within family planning and so on, but because the, the pill was created to separate reproduction from sex so that we can separate sex from marriage so that we can live our way instead of God's way. We can be the gods of our own body rather than doing what God has called us to do. So then we, we do things that are unnatural in the process of that. Uh, even, you know, then we have to, to get around that. So we separate sexuality and reproduction we separate marriage and sexuality. We separate marriage and reproduction. So now we've come to a place in society, and, and our older listeners will remember that this has not been the norm until recent times, uh, where you no longer need to have a, a, a married man and woman to adopt children. That's, right. that's not how it is anymore. That used to be absolutely required. Well, now you have Catholic adoption organizations who are being uh, told that they're not allowed to require that and and in some cases even being shut down in some places um, I believe there's uh, I, I want to say it was Canada I, I won't get the story right so I don't want to try and quote it but but there was a big lawsuit trying to deal with that very thing that the Catholic organization that was setting up these adoptions to help children to help families was not allowed to be catholic was not allowed to hold to their own standards of what they believed to be right and wrong and the reasons for it were exactly the things that we talked about on sunday and eventually we'll get to talking about here today since we're going to be at the end of the podcast before we get there Um, but but all of this is part of god's intentionality for marriage sexuality and family so uh anyway that we don't understand the rules. We don't understand the reasons for the rules. And if we don't understand that rules are not there to take away our enjoyment, but to enhance it, to give meaning and purpose to it, so that uh, we can have everything that God intends for us, 
then we're not going to obey them. We're not going. To, we're not going to. We're going to rebel against them. Even if we obey, we're going to uh, not have. A, we're going to have a resentful attitude. I, I was reading from uh, a, I would call a pseudo Christian author, someone who was uh, with a Christian publisher and and uh, had was writing an article in a magazine talking about how harmful they felt the purity culture was of the '90s. That they grew up in a youth group in the '90s and uh, it was. You know, people promised them, which I don't think probably happened in the vast, vast majority of the cases, having been a youth leader in the 90s, that if you just wait for marriage, it'll be beautiful and sex will be awesome and it'll be perfect and everything will be great. And then it wasn't. Well, see, they all lied and purity culture was harmful. No, that understanding is harmful because you are expecting something that God never promises. Right. We have focused on a post 70s american concept of of sexuality that is not what it's for well here's here's my issue and and bringing it back to the marriage part of it tied with that you you talked a lot on sunday and you've talked to to me personally and and you know other other times before about the picture that is represented here Hmm. uh through marriage and, and, and sexuality and family, but specifically marriage right now. And I feel like one of the major problems that we face is that picture has become so distorted. Absolutely. So we feel like everything within marriage, you know, you're, when you get married, that everything's going to, you know, fall into place. But because the picture is so distorted, it doesn't. And then it becomes a letdown. And then you start freaking out. And then, you know, right. it just it's, it's, it keeps snowballing. And uh, I, I don't know. That's That was a – that picture and the idea of that picture being distorted and just almost cracked to me is, is, is a huge issue that it, we're it, facing. I think it's probably the hugest issue. And it starts way before we realize it starts. Right, and yes. So, you know, and, and not to make this overly personal, but just when you were going through your own marital things and we were right. doing the counseling at that, at that point, <laughs> um, you know, we talked about the fact right. that you had expectations sure. that and who were you know? <laughs> totally not realistic. Right. You, and you were set up for that mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. You poor victim, you. Uh, but, you know, from wanting to have the, you know, the June Cleaver experience and wanting the Hallmark movie and and all that kind of stuff and and again those things are great fairy tales are great but the happily ever after is that's the majority of life they leave that part out of the story (laughs) it gets you know told in the happily ever after but not how do you get to how do you get from that kiss that wakes up the sleeping princess to happily ever after well you get there through a lot of work Mm -hmm. and marriage is not as hard as we make it out to be and I tend to say this in, in all the messages I give during a wedding ceremony. Marriage isn't as hard as we make it out to be. But being a grown-up is. Mm-hmm. Learning the hard, difficult, mature choices, that's hard for all of us, whether you're married or single or, or whatever else. And marriage doesn't make that more difficult. It just forces the issue. It brings it to the front. Well, right. And, and ultimately, I mean, again, without getting into too much detail, I think that was a big issue in my marriage is it brought some things... Uh, I don't. I won't talk about other people, but it brought some things to the surface that didn't need that weren't yeah. a focus before because they didn't need to be. Right. But then it brought it forward, and that you know creates and, issues. And kids do that too. You know, right. you get married, it brings it out. Having kids brings it out. So there's a lot of times I'll, I'll talk about the idea that that we have ceilings on our maturity, and mm-hmm. until we have certain levels of adversity, certain things that force us out of ourselves. Mm-hmm. We just can't progress beyond that. Right. And so a single person has a certain ceiling on that maturity because ultimately you are uh, virtually autonomous. You make decisions for yourself. When you get married, now you're making decisions with someone else. And it's not the same as dating or or living together. There is is a a connection there that this covenant of being one flesh means I don't get to make my own decisions anymore. We are in this together in an inseparable partnership. Then you add a kid to the mix. Now you have this little person, this life that is utterly dependent on you. And now my choices are of such small consequence for me as compared to for this child Mm -hmm. that all of my seeking pleasure, and and we've been lied to my entire lifetime and probably before that with the the message that you can really have it all. You You can be a mom and have a career and, you know, 
have fun and pursue all the things that you enjoyed as a single college student while being married, all, the, all of that stuff. That's just not true. It's never been true. It, it can't be true. It's not logically reasonably tenable to be able to say that I can have all of these things without sacrifice. That is not how reality works. There is a, there's a, an economy of these things that is always true. And so for us to, um, to, to recognize what, when you were probably in fourth or fifth grade in elementary school learning core democratic values, they probably taught you about opportunity cost. They probably did. So I can, <laughs> I can do all of these things, right. but I can't do them all at once. Right. You know, the idea and of if I, I do this, I might be giving up this. Right. You know? So I, I can't have my cake and eat it too. In right. other words, if I have it and then I eat it, I don't have it anymore. Right. So I can't do all Probably of that Probably still going to eat it. Life, life is like a coin. You can spend it any way you want, but you can only spend it once. All of these little adages and axioms come to that same idea of opportunity cost. I can't have everything. So when I talk to people who say, boy, I just want the kind of marriage that you have, or I want the kind of marriage that my grandparents had or whatever, well, that's great, but you can't get there on the path that modern society has put us and on. And that's especially true when you are in a marriage and it seems like it's falling apart and you look at others Absolutely and you're like, right. man, I wish I had that. How'd they get that? Blah, blah, blah. If I just did this, if he just did they're that, so if we lucky. just did it right. And, and so often we look at it, they're so lucky. And the lens of, through the lens of social media, I think has made that worse. Much because worse. Because we see, you know, people, social media is a highlight reel of your life. It's and not, and most know, often it's a lie. Right. It's, it's a, right. a photoshop. It is a false lie. It's a um, photoshopped highlight reel. Right. But uh, I think that's made it worse. Anyway, uh, you were going to read a passage, so I won't describe well, you. Well, <laughs> you know, you brought up the idea that, that there, we have these false expectations. Right. And, and, and so it, does, it starts before we ever get to marriage mm -hmm. in that we are not learning as little children the way previous generations, and when I say previous generations, I mean at least four generations back. My parents' generation learned this better than I did, but they didn't learn it as well as their parents' generation or the ones before that. But we're not learning as little children what marriage is about, what mm -hmm. relationships, grown-up relationships are about. And now we are at a place in our society where we're actively teaching against mm -hmm. the nuclear family. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a central belief of the Black Lives Matter organization. Their central beliefs involve destroying the nuclear family. I was shocked to read that in their own materials. Uh, that's where we're at in our society, where people who are supposedly promoting one thing for the, for the supposed betterment of a person oh, or a sure. group of people are actually subverting the very things that can save the group of people they suppose to be, that they are supposed to be helping. Uh, and then we see that in the church. When the church acquiesces to the world's standards of morality, we are doing the opposite of what we are supposed to be doing, that as the church, we should be elevating life and we're actually denigrating it as we go through this. So what from the way we approach dating and even you know Disney Channel shows where it's all about this coupling and your first kiss as a 10 year old or whatever all of these things that we've made sport we've made this mm -hmm. this is part of your passages well look part at of your dating apps stuff. you know Absolutely. i'm gonna swipe right on this person and swipe left on the I'm like what i mean <laughs> here's my offensive hashtag unpopular opinion we we see that almost at, at almost a pinnacle of that in things like The Bachelorette or right. or what's the one where you meet and marry somebody like on oh, the show. Oh, 90 Day Fiance something, or something you know, like they, that. They've yeah. got all these shows. That's one, all those things are 100% a game, a right. sport. That's and, not... And you are destroying the very foundation of what marriage is about. So then we end not up with even these... marriage, but being in a relationship. Right. <laughs> well, and, and, and that's the thing. Marriage isn't in itself ontologically different than other human relationships. Right. It's just the pinnacle. It's right. the apex. And so when we see any human relationship, it's reflected in marriage. And right. it's a reflection of marriage. And all of that is designed to be a reflection of the reality of God and his relationship uh, to his people, which that was our, our core reality, that God designed marriage, sexuality, and family to illustrate his relationship to his people, which is kind of the point of the expectations mm -hmm. issue. We believe, we have come to, to learn that marriage is somehow about me, mm -hmm. and it's really not. And that's hard for us to swallow because we've been told so much about, you know, it's being in love, it's, you know, hot monogamy, and, you know, all the... what 
different phrases that, that people use for, for, you know, keeping romance and all that kind of stuff. Romance is the smallest part of marriage. I'm going to look into the camera for our video and say romance, as somebody who's been married for 32 years last week, romance is the smallest part of marriage. And I am absolutely crazy in love and infatuated with my wife. Nobody digs romance more than I do. You know, I'm the guy who likes Hallmark movies. You know, this, this is a big deal for me. But it is so small in comparison to the, the greater ingredients of marriage. When you make cookies, okay, because marriage cookies, it makes sense, right? When, when you add in large... I'm single and I make cookies. The larger <laughs> quantities of the ingredients. Right. Salt is not one of them. Hopefully. Salt is not something you add a cup of. Right. Something Unless you you're my child. Of. But if you don't have this, if you don't have these, these small flavorings, then you're missing something from the cookie. Mm -hmm. It's still a cookie. It's still maybe even a good cookie. But it's more enjoyable when you have that. Romance is kind of like that in marriage. It's the small ingredient. It has a powerful impact, and it's very worthwhile. You should definitely have it. But you can have the cookie without the salt. You can't have the cookie without the flour. You can't have the cookie without the whatever else goes in cookies. I, my wife does the baking. I don't you have do to worry eating. about that. I do the eating. Well, here's the other thing. I think it kind of coincides with other things we've been saying. The romance part of a relationship or marriage is, I mean, I won't single out men. Yes, I will. Uh, they complain about it. You know, oh, you know, I got to buy flowers. Now listen. I gotta do, yeah. No, I got to yeah. buy flowers. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know, it's You're a, right. the stereotype. Uh, that, you know, buying flowers, chocolates, doing romantic gestures, whatever. But in reality, the romance part of a marriage or a relationship is the easy part. Because it, it, it might take some conscious effort. It's the part that we tend to work most at. <laughs> right. But it's the part that actually requires the least work. If we right. work at the other parts, the romance tends to follow. Right. There's an old adage in, in counseling, and uh, I'm sure many people have heard it before, that uh, that. <laughs> women give sex to get love and men give love to get sex. Right. You know, and that's the, the perspective. And that's the and idea it's not that entirely have. true, but that is how we have that's this idea the norm. that men will do nice things for their wives right. too, you know. And, and and there's a certain reality to that. Uh, men and women are very different. You know, somebody no. said, you know, <laughs> somebody <laughs> said men are like waffles and women are like spaghetti, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, but the all of those different things, when we deny the differences... We deny what God has intended for us. God created us male and female on purpose. He created us for relationships on purpose. He created us for a sexual and marital relationship. Those things go hand in hand. Uh, he created us for that on purpose. And he created us for a reproductive family setting on purpose. All of those things are intended to give us a picture of his relationship to his people. So um, while I'd love to go through more of the details of it, we, we're way beyond that because we're past our time already. But, uh, but as we understand our, our picture of this, a couple of things we need to understand. God intentionally built these things into the created order. Mm -hmm. it, it's, not, it's not in the Mosaic law and that's where it starts. It's not in the teachings of Christ, and that's where it starts. Jesus refers back to the created order. He goes beyond the law. He goes beyond commands to this is how God designed it to be. And speaking specifically of divorce, divorce is an affront to God. And there is no such thing as, di as divorce that does not involve sin. It may be your sin. It may be your mate's sin. It may be both of your sin. But there is sin involved mm -hmm. that causes that to happen. It doesn't happen just you, you sneeze and all of a sudden you're divorced. Right. Uh, there's a process that goes goes on through this because we're choosing things that are not consistent with God's design for marriage. But all of that was intentionally created by God and hardwired into us. Uh, secondly, we notice that God communicates his relationship to his people in terms of marriage, sexuality, and family. In other words, he uses that language throughout the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation to convey whether he's talking about uh, the... the uh, the primeval history, you know, before uh, Israel is on the on the board here, uh, whether it's in the history of Israel, whether it's the post uh, post Hebraic history, and we're looking at at the church, uh, all of all of this stuff. When God 
talks about how he relates to his people. He talks in terms of, uh, of groom and bride, and husband and wife, and uh, father and children constantly. You can't escape it. There's no way that you can see the Bible, read any portion of it, and not see that because it's just replete with those pictures. And it's designed, he gave us this so that he can convey himself to us. Not only, I mean, there's, you know, right. I don't want to limit the purposes of God, but we know for sure this is the explicit purpose of God, and it's demonstrated. And so we see in proper marriage, proper parenting, uh, pop, proper views of sexuality, that God's love is volitional. It's an act of the will. It's it's a faithful, enduring, persevering love that is, that is uh, filled with integrity and authenticity. Uh, we see that God's love is intimate. It's, it's a knowing and being known from, from the picture of the book of Exodus as God reveals himself intimately to a people, to how he interacts with us through Christ and the Holy Spirit in the Gospels. The, the picture of intimacy with God is one key aspect of what he's trying to communicate to us it's weird to say trying with God. What he is communicating right. to us. The trying is on this. our side. Right. And we see also that God's love is holy. Mm-hmm. It's not like other loves. It's it's pure. It is uh, 100% good and right and glorious. Mm-hmm. That's the love of God. And so these are the things that we need to be conveying through marriage and the act of marriage and the product of marriage as we look at marriage, sexuality, and family. And then the other thing that we want to make sure we catch from it is that our handling of marriage, sexuality, and family reflects our relationship to Christ. If I say, and this uh, we'll get into more of the details of of some of this next week as we talk about uh, sexual um, commands in scripture and and, uh, the differences between norms and God's expectations, the... That'll be fun. It, 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 yeah, so many hashtags. Anyway, uh, as we look at these things, if I claim to follow Christ and I'm not obeying in these areas, I'm not following Christ. Right. I, I'm not. I'm not telling you that if you get this wrong, you're not saved. But if it is, if you're okay with getting it wrong, you're not saved. If you're okay, or if with, you're trying to twist it to your yeah, own, if, you if know. this is about doing your thing instead of God's thing, and you're good like with any that, other. Right. then the Holy Spirit is not in you. Right. Because if the Holy Spirit is in you, He's nagging at you. He does it with a still small voice. He doesn't scream at you, and it's easy for you to ignore. But when you are in sin and you think you're okay with God, you are not. That's really important for us to recognize. Sexual sin is no small matter, uh, and, and parenting is a, is a sacred duty and a holy privilege. These are crucial things for us to recognize, and we'll see those over the next couple of weeks. Well, I'm sorry we went over. I feel like we could have gone even further. With days and days. <laughs> days and days. So uh, we will stop there. But yeah, next week, uh, come back, because as I said, we're talking about sexuality, so that should be barrel of fun yeah in case um, you're listening with your kids which i don't know why you would we're not that much fun but if uh if you're listening with your kids next week might be a good time to listen with just uh you know teenagers not, not adults kids. kind of things uh, or wear headphones <laughs> or be ready to explain some things true i'm not so i won't be listening with my child. uh but yeah join us next week uh if you guys have any questions or comments about today's discussion you can feel free to send us an email at something real at reallifeonline.org leave us a comment on facebook or youtube or leave us a voicemail at 269-756-RLCC and i think that's all the ways to you're getting pretty good us. at this it's a new it's year like, it's like we've done a couple hundred of yeah. these yeah uh so yeah thank you for listening and we will catch you next time <laughs>